One of my all-time favorite TV shows is back, and thanks to Netflix, it's in <laughs> glorious live action for the second time now, and um, <laughs> oh, it's, 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 it's exciting, it's, <laughs> oh dear. You have tuned in to watch Johnny Law. Don't be daft. Avatar The Last Airbender fans are among some of the luckiest and also some of the unluckiest fans in the entire world, as well, yes, they do have one of the greatest television shows ever made, and unquestionably the greatest television show ever made for a family audience. They do also have the worst live action adaptation I think I've certainly ever seen, and that's all thanks to M. Night Smash. Not Shmam, not Shmam. M. M. Night. Shmam. I always want to go with Shmam Alan. The guy who made the sixth sense. AKA South Asian Michael Jackson. Now, anyone who has watched a handful of videos on this channel will know by now that I am not too fond of this adaptation. I have complained about it numerous times, so I won't waste anyone's time complaining about it again. But to, to sum it up very quickly, it was a classic case of filmmaker gets his hands on beloved IP and thinks that his artistic vision trumps any need to care about the source material. And bing bang boom, you've got yourself box office poison. The movie didn't cover the entire story from the original show and had the audacity to set itself up for a sequel, but it was so universally despised, there was a bigger chance of Master Chief keeping his helmet on in season two. Spoiler alert, that didn't happen. And if you don't like the idea of Master Chief continually taking his helmet off, Maybe you just don't get Halo. Maybe you're just not a, a real fan. Okay, I'm getting distracted now. Back to uh, Avatar. I'm not gonna bother with his last name. I'm just gonna call him M. Knight. M. Knight's adaptation came out all the way back in 2010. And it's only now, almost 15 years later, that someone feels brave enough to step into the ring once again and try their luck. And literally no one was surprised when it was Netflix who stepped forward and picked up the gauntlet, as they are one of the pioneers of disappointing adaptations. Yes, yes, I know. One Piece was very excellent, and of all fan bases to please, I don't know how Netflix managed to please the One Piece fans and produce something good. I know what some of you are gonna say. Johnny, it's because the creator was actually involved from start to finish in the project. Yes, I know. But never mind that, that was a fluke. It was a one-off. My point still stands. Now I remember when Netflix first announced that they were going to be making a live action series remake of Avatar The Last Airbender and that was what about five or six years ago at this point point. and upon hearing the news Avatar fans all over the world united in gently sighing together and saying aloud to themselves Oh no, not again. But then they began releasing concept art that looked pretty cool and announced that it would be made in conjunction with the show's original creators. And two of those original creators, Michael and Brian, seemed pretty stoked to be a part of it, saying, it's a once in a lifetime chance to build upon everyone's great work on the original animated series and go even deeper into the characters, story, action, and world building. Netflix is wholly dedicated to manifesting our vision for this retelling, and we're incredibly grateful to be partnering with them. And with that announcement, all of a sudden, the winds have changed. Well, they changed. And Avatar fans all over the world slowly started coming around to the idea that maybe, just maybe, Netflix might actually be able to pull this off. And, after more than a decade, they might finally receive the live action adaptation they'd been promised, myself included. I was genuinely optimistic to see what it is that they'd make. But of course, all good things must come to an end. And in 2020, those same creators who had originally expressed their enthusiasm to be a part of Netflix's live action series announced that they would be walking away from it, explaining that they couldn't control the creative direction of the series. If the original showmakers were so unhappy with the creative direction of the new series that they had to walk away from it, You've got to wonder what was going on behind the scenes. And that's exactly what Avatar fans were doing. And they found themselves now for a second time saying, Oh no, not again. And all of the other fandoms collectively reached out with open arms to embrace Avatar fans and warmly welcome them to the club. As we've become uncomfortably used to the people who care most about our favorite IPs being pushed out of or walking away from their respective projects. It's something that fantasy, sci-fi, superhero, animation, comic book, manga, anime, and video game fans have just had to learn to live with in recent times. And that is that normies will always know better than you when it comes to the things that you like most in this world because you're intolerant and you're a toxic fan base. How dare you like a thing you bad bad man stop liking the thing after the announcement that the original showmakers had left the live action project people generally lost interest and things went pretty quiet and that was until about a month ago 
And that is when the new showmakers began releasing little, little crumbs of information about the upcoming series to drum up a bit of hype before its release. But it wasn't the kind of information that you might expect. You might expect interesting little tidbits about the show, a few Easter eggs here and there, but instead they used this opportunity to clarify that Sokka wasn't going to be a raging sexist and that Aang's side quests just aren't that important. And then fans quickly, and rightly, pointed out that both of these things were important to the character development of both Sokka and Aang. But don't worry, because that's not where Netflix's unusual decisions for this show ended. Now, if I said to you, Avatar, what comes to mind? You might say, Appa, Boomy, The Face Dealer, not that one, Leaves from the Vine, any number of great things. But on a list of things you probably didn't say is 23-time tennis Grand Slam winner Serena Williams. And if you are currently wondering what it is that I'm on about, allow me to show you. That, that's Avatar State. Like, Serena is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, female tennis players of all time. Undoubtedly. What does that have to do with Avatar? Well, it's not... It's not relevant, is it? You disgust me. And comparing the Avatar state to, <laughs> to serving in tennis, uh, it, it, it's not exactly helping with the accusations that this show isn't really in touch with Avatar or its fan base. I have been wrestling to form even a slightly tangible explanation as to what relevance <laughs> these two things have. And the only connection that I could muster is that Aang somewhat resembles a tennis ball. <laughs> well, never mind all that, because it's now time to watch and break down the actual series itself. But just before we do, a word from today's sponsor. Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. So we're here to make it as easy as possible for you to set up your own brand new website. And if you're anything like me, you won't know the first thing about web design. And maybe the word Python to you means snake and not language. Well, welcome to the club, but fear not because you are exactly who Squarespace was designed for. After using the service myself, I can tell you that creating a website using the designer is remarkably easy and is somewhat akin to personalizing a social media page more than it is hardcore coding and graphic design. Even if you have the creative inclination of a wet house brick. They've got templates and guides that can help you to create a site that looks more Da Vinci than, well, Kandinsky, if you know what I mean. I'm actually very fond of the work of Kandinsky, but you know, if you want to look professional, neat is always nice and it's never been easier with Squarespace. So to get you started, head on over to squarespace.com forward slash Johnny Law and use code Johnny Law at checkout to get yourself 10% off your first site or domain. And a big thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. I suppose we'll start with episode one, shall we? And it turns out, right off the rip, uh, Ang can fly. But it's, his glider stick is like, like a that's like a part of his character design. It's literally, you know, when you see people cosplaying as Ang, you get the little monk suit, you get the stick. Bing, bang, boom, you got Ang. I mean, you gotta be bold like me. Maybe I'm the avatar. No, I'm definitely just, I'm definitely just bald. Wait, they didn't get rid of it, but the, but what's, what's the point if you can just fly? Quick note, we are about 10 minutes into episode one. And so far, I couldn't call the, you know, I couldn't call the acting bad, but I couldn't call it particularly good either. Uh, Could have fooled me. <laughs> That's a, that's a great laugh you've got there. That's that's outstanding. Okay, I am a little bit worried because we are about 15 minutes into episode one and Ang is now monologuing to Appa, talking about how, you know, he, he doesn't want to take on the responsibility of being the Avatar and he just wants to be a normal kid. I don't want to leave. I don't want the responsibility. I'm scared of my power. I'm scared of being alone. While that is accurate to Ang's character, he, he is just a kid and he wants to remain just a kid. He doesn't he, he doesn't feel ready or feel that he wants the responsibility of being the Avatar. It wasn't quite so on the nose. It was implied gradually throughout an entire series, usually through his side quest, which is why the creator's coming out and saying that they scrapped all of that 
is so disappointing. Aang spends essentially the entirety of season one running from himself, which makes for an incredibly emotionally satisfying climax to season one when he stops running and truly embraces his role as the Avatar. But rather than weave a long, organic story, just like the original series, the creators have instead opted for Aang coming out and just, just saying it. Straight off the bat, really spelling it out for you. I don't want the responsibility. L plus L plus missed the point of the original show. One of the main reasons that the original animation is so beloved is because it didn't insult the intelligence of the children who watched it. It told multiple complex stories using elaborate narrative structures with visual and contextual cues. Sure, you may have understood more of its nuances upon rewatching it as an adult, but it showed you dignity in the first place. This remake is not only live action, but it is also set for a more mature audience. The original was a U or a PG here in the UK, which is family rating, the new series is rated as a 12. It's literally like a step up in maturity when it comes to uh, film rating. But so far, it has been less mature. It's been less sophisticated in the way that it tells its stories. Now, obviously, calling the original series just a children's cartoon might be slightly underestimating, uh, you know, the power of that series. But at the end of the day, that is what it is. It is a children's cartoon and it is currently outperforming this new mature series. So there is no denying that the visual effects, for the most part, particularly for a series, are spectacular. I was genuinely impressed with the look of some of the element bending. Sure, impressive fire simulation is nothing groundbreaking these days, but representing air on screen, that's, you know, that's a little more tricky because, well, it's air, you can't really see it. So pulling that off and also giving it a sense of danger is, it's a tall order. And I think the effects department really delivered. A lot of thought was clearly put into how the elements would look and act on screen, but I'm equally impressed with the thought that clearly went into how different elements might interact with each other on screen. Take this, for example. It's a great little touch to incorporate that, you know, the mirage, that like heat shake effect as the fire begins heating the air. You know that blur that you see on a, a road on a hot day? I mean, almost no one will pick up on it, but it really helps to sell the scene. It displays, a, you know, a good bit of attention to detail. It's a shame I can't say the same about the writing and the acting. This series is currently being hard carried by the effects department. And talking of the acting, if you told me that some of the actors were reading the lines for the first time on set off an auto cue, I'd believe you. The fishing boats came back empty. Just proves if you want something done right, you gotta do it yourself. Yeah, they just don't appreciate your incredible leadership skills. That's right, they don't realize it. This would be impressive if it was an AI-generated scene. And that's about as positive as it can be about the, the writing and the, the delivery. I would call the delivery wooden, but uh, I actually quite like things that are made out of wood, so for now I'm just going to call it a, a bit shit. Now everyone knows the greatest character from the original series was Iroh, who was one of the more complex characters. He had both a dark past and a bright future. And although an ex-general of the Fire Nation, he acted as an unflinching moral anchor for both Zuko and the show as a whole. Incredibly patient, incredibly wise, and knew to understand and respect his enemies. And on top of that, was portrayed by two fantastic voice actors. So I've got to say that I'm a little bit disappointed with live action Iroh. You know, like a lot of the characters, he looks the part, but he, he's missing that weathered, soulful delivery and seems to have taken a lot of his acting cues from Dwayne The Rock Johnson, if you know what I'm saying. Do you know, I really don't like this whole Ank and Fly thing. It, it looks, it looks goofy. But Johnny, the airball thing looks goofy too, but you like that, what's your problem? That was cool. That was original. Pardon me if after a decades long face pounding from Marvel, I apologize if our flying guy isn't particularly inspiring. Water, earth, fire, air. Long ago, the four nations lived together in harmony. Then everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Hey, hold on a minute, lady. We're more than half an hour in, and now we get into the original intro. Everyone in the village knows this story, but you don't, do you, young man? He is the last airbender. Really spelling it out for us, huh? Yet another section of lazy and long exposition. They're just condensing all of the important themes and arcs from the original into throwaway pieces of dialogue so they can rush into the next action scene. This is antithetical to the approach of the original. God damn it. The story's important. I don't understand why they keep brushing over it. It takes Aang a long time to come to terms with the fact that he's been frozen for a hundred years and that everyone that he cares about 
is now gone. He's in such deep denial that even when he returns to the Southern Air Temple, the mood is jovial. It's only when he comes face to face with the remains of Monk Yatso that he finally starts to come to terms with the situation. In the live action show though, an old woman just tells him how it is. Just as you don't know that airbenders haven't been seen in generations and that the Southern Air Temple was the first to fall. And he's just like, oh, oh, okay. A hundred years. All my friends, everyone I know, they're all gone. I'm, I'm sorry. Wow. <laughs> just feel the empathy leaping out the screen at me. I abandoned my people and everyone I loved is now gone. I'm, I'm sorry. Believe me, I know how hard it is to lose the people you love. I'm getting a little more sedation. <laughs> And sadness, I'm not gonna lie, but they've taken they've taken that piece of dialogue from the moment where Katara is trying to calm Aang down when he enters the Avatar state once he sees Monk Yatso. And I know how hard it is to lose the people you love. I went through the same thing when I lost my mom. That scene had so much more emotional weight behind it, and it sets Katara up as Aang's like emotional anchor for the rest of the series. But then again, you know, with the live action, they've just turned it into just a throwaway piece of dialogue. Like, we've not seen Aang's pain yet. We've not, like, we've got, we've not made a connection with him. We've not seen him visit the Air Temple. We've not seen him witness the bones of Monkey Yat. So we don't, like, he's just been told by a woman. We've got no skin in the game. Once again, kids cartoon outclasses mature adaptation. He's more than the last airbender, aren't you? You are the Avatar. Okay, this exposition lady is really starting to rustle my jimmies right about now. She's literally a walking, talking spoiler. It's like, it's like remaking Game of Thrones and then episode one, having someone walk in and go, what's up guys? Um, yeah, Jamie likes his sister a bit too much. Uh, Bran gets himself a wheelchair. All right, bye, I'm out. Well, I now see what they mean when they said they were toning down Sokka's sexism and by that they mean they just got rid of it entirely which couldn't have missed the point of the original show more. To give you a brief explanation, throughout the first season, Sokka constantly ogles over and underestimates the women around him, and as a result, continually gets his ass handed to him until he eventually starts to learn from his actions. This is me when I respect women. And then, as a result of this character growth, he eventually falls in love. It's an emotionally satisfying arc, if you ignore the fact that his girlfriend turns into a large celestial body. Spoiler alert, sorry. But to put it simply, it's a satisfying arc that teaches you to show respect. Respect women. Contrast that once again with the live action, and they think that getting rid of the quote-unquote sexism is a chad move because sexism is a bad, but that is just the most childish, low IQ way of looking at it. Pretending that your characters are perfect or that they don't have flaws to overcome is not morally righteous writing. It's bland and inhuman. Wait, I spoke too soon because this time, get this, the girl is eyeing up Sokka and not the other way around. You see what they did there? Netflix have single-handedly cured all sexism in the world. Thank you, Netflix. Very cool. I never had the courage to leave. I've always wondered what I'd find. Now I know. They took what was originally a great scene, removed all nuance, and left us with twilight level romance. I, uh, ah, I love 2024. It's, uh, it's really good. It's, ah, oh, what a time to be alive. Also, not to be the guy who cried girl boss, but why does Aang keep getting his thunder stolen? In the original, it was Aang who saved the trio from Zuko's firebolt. In the live action, they swapped that to Katara. I, even though she's a long way from any water, I mean, just don't ask any questions. And in the original, Aang does what he can to fight off the Fire Nation and extinguishes the burning village, but in the live action, Aang can now morph into past avatars and they swap Aang out with Kyoshi. Okay. So, we're on to episode three and there's a weird moment where Zuko seems to be schooling Iroh about honor and etiquette. He was only trying to help. He was gossiping about a superior officer. An officer you don't like? That's beside the point. There is an order to the way we do things here. Anyone who's seen the original would know that this is pretty contradictory to the original characters. I mean, you know, Iroh is incredibly wise and respectful and acts as a guide and as a father figure for the naive and headstrong Prince Zuko. So why is it Iroh the one that's endorsing gossip? It, just, it this seems antithetical to his beliefs and who he is as a character, but what do I know? And it would appear that Katara's waterbending is improving as she can throw an entire bucket of water in her face and poof! Instantly dry, would you look at that? Right, watch this clip and tell me that this doesn't sound like some action self-insert fan fiction you'd write about yourself as an eight-year-old. The dialogue, 
<laughs> the dialogue. It's what the French would call le not so good. Good news? The best. It may have taken a while, Lieutenant Day, but we are finally in the big game. It's just corny. I, I, I don't know what to say. How do you know it's been three years? You have my notebook! You have my notebook! <laughs> Sorry. One thing I've not really heard anyone mention as well is, is that Appa doesn't really play a part in this show. He, he gets all of, like, five minutes worth of screen time. I mean, you know, I guess... I, I, I guess it's not the biggest deal in the world, maybe? But I'll tell you what is the biggest deal in the world. I just can't remember who Ang is or what Ang is. And I just... I wish that people would constantly remind me. He is not just an airbender. He is the master of all four elements. The savior of the world. He is... the Avatar. Hold on just a moment. Are you... Are you telling me that Ang is the Avatar? Is the Avatar? Well, here I am. Four episodes deep. No, I have no idea. Well, how about that? Man, they really spoiled the character of Boomy as well, didn't they? Like, in the original, I know I keep saying this, but in the original, he's intentionally unfunny. That, that's part of the charm of his character. That's the joke. People, no one in the palace bothers laughing at him. They're clearly sick of his puns. So tell me, young bald one, where are you from? I'm from Kangaroo Island. Oh, Kangaroo Island, eh? I hear that place is really hopping. <laughs> it's charming. It's funny. But in the live action, they've, they've changed his character from like a slept on, unfunny Giga Chad into someone who's a little more dictatorial. Like people laugh at his jokes just out of obligation. Short ribs from Kangaroo Island. They practically jump into your mouth. <laughs> They made a likable, intentionally unfunny character dislikable and unironically unfunny. Whoever came up with that idea, that's <laughs> good stuff. Keep it up, big fan. How about you? I bet you like meat. Huh? I can still smell smoke when I go to sleep at night. You might want to refer yourself to a medical practitioner, my friend. That could, that sounds like a stroke. Could be a struggle. But jokes aside, they've spoilt yet another poignant moment from the original. Of course, anyone who watched the OG show knows Leaves from the Vine. And of course, they were never going to recreate the emotional weight of that scene, as it was not only a memorial of Iroh's son in the show, but also Mako, the voice actor who played Iroh in the first season. And it's a classic case of breaking the show, don't tell rule. Rather than a nuanced scene, we get Zuko telling us how great this character we've not met is, and it doesn't mean anything to the viewer. In the original, by this point, we've already developed a deep connection with Iroh through his interactions and growth with Zuko, and it's that connection that allows us to empathise with him, even though we know essentially nothing about his son. But flip back to the live action, and this character has had very little, if any, progression at all. We feel the same about him, we are just as emotionally invested as we were at the start of the show. And though I do appreciate the subtle rendition of the Leaves from the Vine melody that's playing in the background during this scene, you can't lean on nostalgia to convey sadness. And this scene just doesn't carry its weight. And that's a real shame because this is one of the tentpole moments in Iroh's story. It's blind. They don't navigate by sight, but by feeling. They sense feelings and react to them. Anger, fear, but mostly love. The exposition is so real. It's just, it's just explanation after explanation after explanation after ex can we not convey these things through storytelling? Is, is that not a thing anymore? I'll tell you what this is. It's lazy and it's incompetent. What are you looking at me for? You think like a child. Is that really so bad? When I was about, I don't know, like six or seven years old, there was this kid in my class and he'd heard the term buckworm. And upon hearing this term, he came to the conclusion that if he stuck a worm in his nose and it went, into his brain, it would make him smarter. Yeah, sometimes kids are really stupid and it's okay not to think like them. Yeah. Now, I will say that I liked how they dived a little deeper into the face stealer, and I think that they did a perfect job of representing him on screen. Though I did prefer the show no emotion idea from the original, it made for a, a much more tense scene, certainly. But 
It was the first arc in this series that I actually quite enjoyed. In other news, Aang then meets with Monkey Atso in the spirit realm and they have a deep intellectual conversation. And upon the conclusion of this conversation, Monkey Atso in all his wisdom then begins talking to a lamp. Time. Time is a funny thing. Well, I don't know why he's talking to a tree. Tonight, we will snap love great! You know, I didn't realize that that was three words, but here we are. I know I shouldn't have taken your notebook. And I'm sorry. It's been a lifesaver. I can't tell you how many nights I stayed up reading it. Again, could you not have just thrown in a scene or two just showing us that? Like, just sprinkled in here and there throughout the season? Like, why is Aang simply telling us? This is... This isn't big budget stuff we're talking about. We're talking like a couple of like few second scenes where Aang is looking at Prince Siku's joke like, oh, 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 that's all, that's all we need. A lot of the time when I was supposed to be meditating, I was actually sleeping. I'm sorry, you were what? Me meditating. Oh, you were med meditating. I, my apologies. Meditated wham. You know what, guys? I'm, I'm feeling kind of sad, feeling kind of bummed out. And you know what? There's only one thing that will uh, raise my spirits. And that is, I'd like to see a cheesy mirror transition, like something you'd see in uh, like, a, like an early 2000s R&B music video. That, that would be the only thing that could cure this depression. Oh, that, oh, that just, that really hit the spot. Here is a great example of what I mean when I say that Netflix has been watering down the story from the original, literally in this case, as the gang has now arrived in the Northern Water Tribe. Now, in the original, they are initially ambushed and then escorted by the Water Tribe. And once they arrive at the city gate, the waterbenders have this cool lock type system behind the city gate. Lock spelled L-O-C-H, not lock like a door lock, which is a neat little touch. It's details like this that help to enrich fictitious worlds. It's clever. It shows us that security is paramount to the city, which tells us something about the geopolitical situation at that time, particularly with the rise of the Fire Nation. And the design of the gate means that theoretically only a waterbender or someone accompanied with waterbenders can enter the city. The architecture is a result of not advancements in technology, but in advancements with waterbending. This scene is no longer than a minute, but it tells us so much about the pathos of this tribe without even one word of dialogue. Once again, flash forward to the live action. Avatar, welcome to Agnikella. Mm. Yep, they just... They just float in and everyone knows who they are and is calling their names. It's, it, I guess they've got broadband or something now. You could argue that Netflix are doing their own thing. So there's no point comparing it to the original, but you cannot dispute that they are taking elements from the original and presenting you with just a slightly dumber version of what was in the original kids show. This is Avatar The Last Airbender for kids who were only allowed to eat with spoons. If you know what I'm saying. And this is my daughter, Princess Yue, our tribe's spiritual leader. Huh. I, I can't believe I'm saying this because, you know, I have praised a lot of the casting decisions so far. But M. Night's version of Avatar did a way better job of casting Princess Yue. Like, it's not even close. Netflix, if you could stop producing content that makes me compliment that movie of unknown origin or unspecified name, that would be just fabulous. We continue. Now, this is not a problem that is exclusive to this show. It's more a general modern film issue. And that problem is 4K is too detailed. <laughs> now, hear me out. Because 4K is so clear, you can actually see when actors are wearing makeup and things like contact lenses. This isn't a major issue for most productions, granted, but in period and fantasy productions, even that is enough to break your immersion while watching. You might say, Johnny, Okay, now you just you just nitpicking at this point. Stop being an asshole. And to that, I would say, no, shut up. And also, this is filmmaking. This is an art form. It demands, nay, longs for this kind of attention to detail. And especially when making fantasy, if anything could possibly threaten the immersion of a viewer watching your piece of fantasy, that problem should be mitigated. So what I'm saying is, you know, in future, if you're gonna hire someone, you know, who's visually impaired, who wears contact lenses, remove their eyeballs because it's ruining my TV time. And that's, I find that really inconsiderate. Water is life. 
Water allows life to flourish and to heal. Again, just saying it out loud. We can literally see what you're doing. You don't need to tell us. We're not that stupid, most of us. Do you explain your job out loud every time you do that job? If you're a barista and you just sat there like, oh, you know, oh, I'm just, I'm, I'm putting the coffee in the, I'm quickly realizing I don't know how to make a cup of coffee. You get the point. You don't explain it out loud. Every, she's clearly been in the Water Tribe for generations, doing what she's doing for probably decades. There's no way every time she does it, she says what she's doing out loud. Stop breastfeeding us. I knew it. It was you. Yes. You're the fox. Yes. Princess Yue is a furry. Interesting development. Very interesting. You're the fox. Yes. But how? Oh no, you had to ask. <laughs> oh god. I feel a, a mind-numbing epidural of exposition coming on. Not long after I was born, I got very sick. Oh my god. Again. Again. So my father pleaded with the spirits to save my life. And a miracle happened. No, 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 I'm, I'm not doing it. We're, we're moving on. We're moving on. I fear I've underestimated Chow. He's more dangerous than I thought. Hey, look! It's Prince Zuko. I thought he was killed off in the last episode. I wonder how he managed to survive. If only someone would uh, explain it to me in great detail using very simple language. I fear I've underestimated Chow. He's more dangerous than I thought. Yeah, I figured that out as I was swimming away from the burning wreck of my boat. Well, I'm, I'm glad we could clear that up. We're now on episode eight, the climax of the season. I will say the show seems to be finding its foot in slightly more towards the end. It seems to be following the original slightly closer. Uh, and I will say there are some tasty looking shots here and there. You know what? I've always wanted the exact story behind the giant ocean Godzilla creature. If only one of the characters would come along and, and exp <laughs> explain it to me. Bang has given himself over to the ocean spirit, allowing it to channel its rage through him and access the power of the Avatar. <laughs> Thank you, UA. Very cool. Uncle, what? What is that? Oh, no, no, don't ask. Why did you have to ask? Bang has given himself over to the ocean spirit, allowing it to channel its rage through him. No, okay, enough of that. Yeah, we're done. So, the ending wasn't handled as well as the original, shocker, but uh, it was probably the strongest part of the series, if I'm honest. Of all the actors, I think that Daniel D. Kim as Fire Lord Ozai delivered the best individual performance. He was without doubt the most convincing actor. He had this suitable rigidity, and his voice had a nice gravitas. Uh, yeah, I think he I think he did a good job. It's been said that confidence and stupidity is a dangerous combination and well, there might be a bit of truth to that. I see that and I'll raise you bad writing and young acting. For me, other than the creators missing the point of what made the original so great, by far the worst aspect of this show was the writing. It's, it's grammatically correct, sure, but this was genuinely some of the most insultingly dumbed down dialogue I've heard since the CBeebies days. The only show I can think to compare to this script-wise is this. Maka paka, aka waka, mika maka moo. Maka paka, apa yaka, ika aka oo. The original show is all about mastering all four elements, whilst the show itself perfectly balances all elements of entertainment and of humanity. Action, romance, humor, struggle, conflict. It has it all and it balances it perfectly. But Netflix is offering, rather than balancing all elements like an avatar should, it leaned heavily into the aesthetic and everything else suffered because of that. Though M. Night's movie is definitely a worse adaptation and a worse piece of entertainment, the Netflix series is by far a bigger blunder because they had over a decade's worth of hindsight to learn from all of the mistakes that that film made and ended up ultimately making the exact same mistake and that was not attempting to understand what it was that made the original great and underestimating its fan base. Though I will say this, and that is that in recent years, a lot of the remakes we've seen, they have malignant undercurrents. They have a sense of bitterness underpinning them. The one that always comes to mind first is Velma. That show was not made with passion or creative want. It came from an angry, bitter place, and you could feel that while you watched it. People are quick to try and pave their own inadequacies over beloved thoroughfares in an attempt to prove themselves, and some people just like to paint their face over past history. But in the defense of this show, I didn't get that. 
I watch this and I feel a sense that they, they did try to make something good. They did try to make something of value. I don't feel that hate for the source material and for the fans radiating from this. A feeling that we're so used to as fans these days. It didn't feel like malicious revisionism. It felt more just like incompetence. It's that those at the top of the production chain just didn't have the balls or the brains to pull this off. It's as simple as whoever they were, they just weren't good enough. This show is a product of someone who watched the original series but didn't listen. It wasn't bad, but it certainly wasn't good. And that just about concludes why it is that Netflix failed to successfully remake Avatar The Last Airbender. I really appreciate you watching the video and I'll catch you in the next one. You know, when you're living the dream, uh, eventually that dream becomes normal and you have to find ways of reminding yourself that you are living the dream because that's exactly what I'm doing. I am living the dream. This is all I've ever wanted in life is to be able to entertain people entertain that's a little subjective i guess but uh it is it's all i've wanted in life and you guys make that possible and I, I couldn't be more thankful for it paid or not if you watch me here on this channel god bless you uh you know it, it really does mean the world to me you've changed my life you've changed my life uh of course the patrons and the channel members we have the top tiers the knights of law we have infinite dum dum Pozzabon, flunky david Jax, Koss, michael turpian texas lawman ats daggerty 69 nice saint nemo Steve the Goat, Michael, Nostagmus, the Grand Admiral, Jordan96, and Satema Kano. To each and every one of you top tiers, like I said, God bless each and every one of you. And of course, the tier twos, we have Saeed, Dr. Maski, Yong, which had to you, Canada Dog Ramachi, Mark Maiden, Sensei Fang, Mendicant, Bias, Agent, Mo 62 Stu Cheeks, Michael S, Rich Walwick, McLegend Face, Kidnap Tiger, and Say It. And of course, a big thank you to each and every one of the tier ones as well. You're the best. You really are, like I say, I'm living the dream. I'm living the dream and it's all thanks to you. Thank you. I was just watching the video back and realized that I'd forgotten to say thank you to Alex F for joining the Patreon. So welcome to the tier one, my friend. It's very good to have you. And there we go. Another day, another video. Will you join me for my next one? You better do, you little bitch. But until then, I'll see you very soon. Big video coming. Big video.